Welcome to the CEO Story, brought to you by KC Johan, founder of Together CFO, where every week we're interviewing the top CEOs in various industries, sharing their journey and extracting the top things that made them successful. Good morning, listeners, and welcome to another episode of the CEO Story. Today we have Frank Cottle, who is the founder and CEO of Alliance Virtual Offices. Frank, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. Frank, you were in the virtual space a long, long time before it ever became popular or a thing. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about Alliance Virtual Offices and what you guys do? And then we'll rewind and, and share the journey along the way. Well, Alliance Virtual, <clears throat> excuse me, um, is a company that uh, helps people to establish um, uh, offices around the world. Uh, we have about uh, 1,300 facilities that we use uh, in 54 countries. And we supply virtual officing environment to everybody from government down to uh, solopreneurs. Uh, so it's a very broadly based um, membership or, or uh, customer base. A virtual office provides a, a company with uh, all the clerical, secretarial, administrative support they require, uh, a physical, commercial address, uh, live receptionist and telephony, everything they need on an as-required basis rather than a fixed term. And <clears throat> we do that by combining people, place, and technology into a single bundle product. Um, so it's a, a very comprehensive service, in, in, in including a lot of technology and a lot of service support. Fantastic. It sounds like that would be in very high demand right now, and especially with the gig economy and kind of <sighs> going more well, in, like you said, the solopreneur way. No, it, it definitely is. Um, uh, people, I think, are recognizing that they need less physical space and more virtual space. So they, they need to be everywhere all at once instead of somewhere permanently. Uh, and certainly large corporates are looking at that. Um, and uh, they're also trying to shed a lot of liability debt from their leasehold interests uh, off their balance sheet right now. Uh, and this is one way they can, can do so um, because we run on 12 month service agreements as opposed to long-term uh, leases. Uh, and that uh, gets a lot, lot of free, free debt off the uh, balance sheet. And that means the ability to borrow more or pre raise more capital on each one. Fantastic. <clears throat> Sounds like a win-win all around. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the start of your career and how you ended up running and, and starting this business? But let's go, let's rewind a little bit. I know that you had a successful stint with Deloitte and you were also a broker of some ships and yachts. So can we rewind a little bit and just share your journey along the way? Well, you can probably tell on the video that I'm not the youngest person you've ever interviewed. Uh, so I started my career in 1969. Uh, I actually started as a commercial diver, uh, doing contract work for one of our uh, U.S. federal agencies uh, during the Vietnam years. Um, so I was what they called a contractor. Uh, did that for a couple of years and then got married in 71. And my wife decided that wasn't a lifestyle that was uh, good for long-term uh, <laughs> marriage. Uh, and so I changed the gears and started a uh, racing and brokering uh, uh, large sailing yachts around the world. Uh, so I spent 10 years doing that. Uh, and then in uh, 79, 80 started the predecessor to this particular company, which was actually, we started originally as a property company. Uh, I come from an old ranching and farming family here in California. And, and uh, uh, so we, uh, we started land banking. Uh, we would build small buildings on the perimeter of a large master plan commercial development. And in doing so, uh, we would uh, build a, uh, a high quality small building uh, right on the edge, but with a, a, a greater entitlement, eight to 10 times entitlement. So I built a 50,000 foot building, but had four to 500,000 feet uh, of uh, entitlement uh, rights to build. Uh, and that was always uh, an exciting, uh, time and that's where we learned to run flexible workspace uh, facilities and that's where we really entered the industry in 1980. so it's been 40 41 
years for me now wow. at doing this. Uh, and uh, we've transitioned from a property company to an operating company. And today we're really more of a software as a service technology company. Um, so how did kind of the, the, the pivot in evolve and come around and when did you know it was a good time to kind of pivot the business several times? Well, I think opportunistically, we looked at each business model we had created and tried to find a valuation point when we thought the value of that model had been maximized relative to the amount of capital we could easily access. And uh, basically just took our profits. Um, and so we did that with our property portfolio, which was fairly extensive across California, Arizona, and Texas. Uh, we did that again with our operating company right at the height of the dot-com boom in between April and August of 2000. And then uh, we restarted the company as a technology company based on some concepts that we were looking at during the dot-com era and decided that we would prefer to run as a tech company than a property company. So it's just a matter of being a good student of the industry, which is something that I really think is important in, in all business. Amelia? very quiet, um, um, uh, to uh, uh, be a really good student of your industry. And then you should, by applying yourself, uh, be able to understand when to pop in and when to pop out. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And along that way, building a, building a team and kind of having um, a core staff or kind of the leadership team of that business along that whole cycle of 40 plus years, how have you went about doing that? And kind of, can you share some of the ups and downs well, each, along that way? Sure. Uh, each type of business was a little different, so required different skill sets in the teams. Uh, the first required great skill, skill sets around real estate development and finance. Uh, the second group, which was an operating company, uh, required really good uh, uh, skills around uh, lease negotiations, uh, uh, management of large blocks of personnel on a distributed basis. We had 195 offices uh, averaging about 40,000 feet each uh, spread all over the United States. Uh, so that was a lot of personnel. And so that was a, a very critical component. And in the current company format, uh, we're again, very distributed, our, our C-level team is. Um, um, but uh, most of the skills are around the finance and technology uh, and, uh, again, product development. So we, we're very involved in developing our own products and, and staying at the forefront of the industry. So different types of teams. And uh, I'm fortunate to say that uh, this last team, which we started in 2002 or three, I guess, We've never lost a, a C-level executive. We've not changed a single one of them since then. Everybody has started in their early 20s, mid-20s, and they're, they're still on board uh, almost 20 years later. So what? So what's some of the secrets that you've used to, to mm -hmm. one, attract the talent, and two, more importantly, maintain and like, keep the talent? I think you, know, you just have to pick the right people to begin with people that uh, you can understand and, and, and that you know they have the skill set so that you don't outgrow them and, and hopefully they, they won't outgrow you as long as the company is growing nicely. Um, so really understanding the skill sets that you need and also the compatibility. Um, uh, our team uh, is, is very uh, much like a big family now. Uh, everybody knows everything about everybody. <laughs> Um, so there's good, bad, and ugly in that sometimes, but but it really is is uh, their loyalties to each other on the team, not just to the company. Um, and I think that that's an important structure. Um, we have two core philosophies in the company that are important to us. Uh, the first is members first. So we look at our clients and our inventory uh, network as being members of our organization and. Every time we make a major decision, the first question we ask is, is this the best thing for the members? Is this what's best for them? If it is, let's do it. If it's not, let's re-examine it and make sure that every decision is made that way. And the second philosophy that we really live by is family first. So inside of the company, everybody really looks out to build the company to protect everyone else and everyone else's family. Uh, and we really, 
kind of live that philosophy, and and it's uh, it's given us a lot of strength and a lot of uh, a lot of peace in the company. Honestly, it's a very very pleasant environment. Oh, I like that a lot. And then to nurture a culture like that as uh, as a CEO, founder of the business, what are some of the tips that that you can share with people that they could implement in their own businesses? Um, probably just be a really good listener really be a very, very, very good listener and, and, and to recognize that you don't always have the best ideas. Uh, just because you're leading doesn't mean that you, you have to, everybody has to do what you say or what you think your ideas are. You should listen, become that best student of your industry and share ideas and then make sure that you come to communal decisions that are progressive, that are not compromised, where, where you build on the ideas as opposed to uh, compromise them and dilute them. No, I, I like that a lot. And then in terms of the future, let's talk about where you see the future of this business or do you see it pivoting again in terms of the <clears throat> virtual offices? Uh, what we, what are you, if you had to predict kind of the next three to five years out, how do you see that going? Well, the, the remote working uh, and virtual office environment is obviously growing. Now, every headline you see today talks about remote work. Um, but, but people are not going to continue working from their homes only on a long-term basis. We know this is a temporary structure. So uh, we create the bridge between people that are working remotely in their homes and larger corporate environments um, where uh, everybody, you know, takes the commuter uh, shuttle into the, into the, corporate headquarters in, in the central business district of a major city, uh, there's a middle ground. And that middle ground are business centers, co-working centers, uh, incubators, accelerators, all different types of new things, uh, operating formats, which are quite popular. And they were popular before our current pandemic. Um, and they'll be even more popular afterwards because people have gotten used to working outside of the major corporate environment. I mean, just imagine the CFO of any Fortune 1000 company today walking through the corporate headquarters. It's empty. It's empty. And the company's working just fine. You think they're ever going to go back? No. So distributed work, hybrid plans on hours, on scheduling, work at home one day, work at a local business or a community center another day, work at the corporate headquarters another day, Look at your client's office another day. All the mobility that we've created through technology that we've been forced to use right now and get good at, um, that's what's going to keep the, the change rolling forward. We'll be seeing virtual reality officing coming up by 2023. Uh, we're already experimenting with holographic lens for meetings and things of that nature. That's all coming along within the next three to five years. Uh, so there'll be a lot of changes in the way we look at the technology and the way we meet um, uh, overall. Uh, so is that you, you'll wear like a VR headset and sit at a table and you'll be in a yeah, but it'll look it'll, it'll look a lot more like the glasses that you and I are wearing. It won't be a big clunky VR headset. The, the, that, that whole technology, the smart glass technologies are, are really coming along. And you see a lot of... Um, uh, uh, prototype stuff that's out now that is ultra light, ultra convenient, and you'll probably just wear it permanently. You'll, you'll just wear it. You won't just put it on for the meeting, uh, or you won't just put it on to be inside of your desktop, because uh, your desktop will be all around you. You'll be oh, wow. totally immersive environment. I had read that uh, Apple was developing some uh, glasses technology. So mm -hmm. interesting. Yeah, every, every, every major tech company is, is working on some aspect of this. And uh, the other thing that's interesting is uh, the large gaming companies are now coming into play. And you say, what? How does that make sense? Well, they're the very best at rendering environments, and creating artificial environments uh, or virtual environments. And the technologies they use to do that, the skill sets they use to do that, they, they, they are creating, and we're working with a couple of them right now, creating actual full virtual officing environments where the whole building is inside of your technology. 
and you can go from room to room, meet with this person and that person, and nobody is in this virtual building physically, of, of course, but it looks and feels like a normal work community. Um, so that's the sort of thing that we think will be coming along, and because we're seeing, I mean, people are working on it. Uh, three, three, four, five years, we'll, we'll see applications like that, and that will cause a complete repurposing of commercial real estate. Uh, it, instead of be, living my life in a cube on a floor in a sea of cubes in a corporate headquarters building somewhere doing whatever I'm doing, I can, I can be anywhere, put on my headset or my, my smart glasses and work in that environment and have a beautiful office, and beautiful surroundings all around you. Uh, uh, just, just like today, you can have a, a virtual background, uh, you know, in, in this meeting. Um, the wall you see behind me is actually on my right hand side. Uh, so in my office, so it, it, it's a very easy to, to manipulate images and, and all of that. And that's going to be a big part of the way we work. In the future. Fantastic. I'm very excited for, for that kind of evolution in technology and, and totally agree with you in terms of big companies actually being more on board and kind of being forced to see the benefits of remote working kind of during this pandemic and to see that not only does it work well, it, it actually benefits a lot of businesses by reducing the overhead of the business. Uh, it, it, it really does. Um, and most of the large companies are right on the cusp of doing something like this anyway, probably not as radical, but in order for it, you know, we, we've had a very strong economy the last several years until the pandemic came along. Um, and in order to win the, the battle for talent, um, all the large companies, particularly large tech companies, they had to have a flexible workplace program in place in order to attract people. Oh, you don't have to come in every day. You can work from your house one day or there's this nice co-working center just down the block to get you an office there instead. Um, the work-life balance that people were starting to demand as being more important than just salary and just climbing the proverbial corporate ladder had put tremendous pressures on large corporations. Uh, and so they were already had one foot through the door of full flexible work programs. And they got kicked in the butt with the pandemic and went flying through the door, if you will. Uh, and now it's, I, I hate the term new normal because every day is normal as it moves forward. We always have a new normal. Uh, but we, we, were, we were forced to make some changes, and now those changes are habit. You know, anytime you, you, you do something for a certain period of time in a different way, that becomes your new habit. So people are not going back to the office in the way they were beforehand. Yeah, and I think, again, rightly so, it, it does make a lot of sense for a lot of businesses to have that flexibility. And I think you put it quite nicely earlier where it's like, it doesn't always have to be 100% remote. It can be a mixture of. It, it, it will be, it absolutely will be. Um, just honestly, mo for most people, their home is not the best place to work. They don't have a private office set up in their home. Uh, they may not have enough bandwidth in their home for the work that they need to do. If you're a video programmer, my gosh, amount of bandwidth you consume is almost impossible to get at a household. Um, so there's a lot of things that say it's not right. The kids, uh, other family members, uh, noise, uh, distractions, um, and not being face to face with your colleagues. So if people want a mixed environment, but wouldn't it be nice to work Fridays from home? You know, wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, okay. Fridays and Mondays. <laughs> yeah, Mondays too. Yeah, okay, I can do that. You can do that. Um, uh, um, and what we found in our own company, we went remote, completely remote early um, on this pandemic. Uh, 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 we have global operations, and as soon as there was mutterings over in China, well, we didn't listen to the news. We called our Chinese offices. <laughs> What's going on? You know, what's going on? What's really happening? We said, oh, this is what's really happening. I really think this is going to be serious. Uh, and, you know, we've lived through the bird flu, the swine flu, the N1H1, SARS, MERS. We've been through a lot of pandemics that we've seen as a company and, and how they affect different places. And so we watched carefully in, in December and January. And then in uh, 
uh, mid-January, uh, we were calling our offices over in Europe, and uh, so they're telling us the same thing. So we went remote completely, 100% of the company in mid, late January. Oh, wow. So, so you were very early. Early. everybody. Yeah, we just said, no, this, we, we're a tech company. We know how to do this. We already have remote setups. Um, we are a virtual company. Um, everybody, we're doing it. That, that meant moving three call centers. Uh, you know, there's a lot, lot, there are a lot of bits and pieces, um, but we actually had our, our tech teams in every different area go out to everyone's home, reinstall a, a full officing setup, multiple screens, servers, et cetera. Uh, and we did it all in about 48 to 72 hours. That's um, amazing. And I think that kind of, that's a good point for the listeners out there to be able to be flexible and pivot on like on a two pence piece if needed, if the company made that decision and be able to execute it so quickly, uh, regardless of if it was pandemic related or just general business related, but that you could make a decision and then roll that out with success across the board shows how uh, prepared you were. Well, I, I think it goes back to those core philosophies. We didn't want to have disruption in our services to our members, and we wanted to do everything possible on our own in advance to protect our staff, which we, that's our family first protection theories. And, and so if it cost us some money to do those things, but we accomplished those things and stayed true to our philosophies, then we believed that we were doing the right thing. And yeah, you, you mentioned stuff. flexibility and it's funny. At a point in time, a few years ago, any company was gonna start out needed two things needed a great product and access to capital so they could scale. Today, the entire world has learned that it needs a great product that has good, good value proposition, still needs access to capital, of course, but it has to be flexible. They have to be able to react flexibly and react quickly. So the agile office, the agile corporation has taken on a whole new dynamic and meaning as opposed to being something you'd read in a Harvard Business Review that sounded good, you know, was, oh yeah, we're an agile company. Well, you've had to prove it lately, uh, how agile you were. And some companies are struggling hugely because of it. Uh, their whole systems need to be looked at, not just their employment systems, but their distribution, their manufacturing, their access of, of products and materials. All of that needs to be agile or flexible as opposed to just thinking, oh, we can send everybody home, that's cool. That's not being flexible, that's just one component of it. Got it, no, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, Frank, thank you so much. As we look to wrap up, I'd like to end with one question. And uh, this is, if you had to attribute your, or split up your success over three different factors, which are drive, skill, and luck, how would you, go, how would you apportion that? Well, I come from an old farming family, and you know, the old farmers always say, better to be lucky than smart. Uh, and I, I think it, you, you make a lot of your own luck by being prepared for things, uh, by, I, I've used the term, being the best student of your industry, by really studying your industry and really studying what's going on in the world around you, as opposed to just being head down and, and focused on that drive, as you say it. That'll get you... You know, you'll, you're just as likely to drive into a wall as you are to reach your destination if that's all you're doing. Uh, so I, I say, be the best student of your industry. Plan on a little luck that you make yourself because you, you, you've been paying attention to things. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Frank, for sharing with us. You've been fantastic. And we'll put a link below so people can uh, connect with you at the uh, Alliance Virtual Offices. Great. Take care, Casey. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.